Yeah, so uh, this particular workshop is going to focus on some of the challenges that lie ahead for California floristics and how we address these challenges from the standpoint of uh, taxonomy and phylogenetics. And I want to give you some background before we get too far into this in this first module, just laying out some of the problems that um, the problem as it exists is it's a wonderful problem with all this continued discovery. And then just give you some essentials of taxonomic practice before we get into more details about taxonomy later. And thanks to all of you for participating today. It's really great to have a group of this size for this first workshop, mini workshop of the season. And I'd also like to use this as an opportunity to talk about some of the online resources for California floristics in the Jepson Flora Project and beyond. So the Jepson eFlora itself is really a response in part to the challenge that I mentioned of continued discovery. We've decided after 2012, when we published the last edition of the Jepson Manual, that we would try to keep the California flora more up to date than just a snapshot every 20 years. And so every year we've been updating the Jepson eFlora, which started out in 2012 as an online Jepson manual and has um, evolved over the years to incorporate changes to our understanding in California floristics. And the reason that we're doing this in part is to be able to keep up with the change, which is really important from both a scientific and conservation standpoint, uh, most fundamentally, so people can actually find these plants in the field in keys to identification and uh, you know they don't slip through unnoticed, which is really important considering that much of the addition to the California flora over the last many years are plants that are endangered upon discovery and description. So this is a really important mission of ours, not only to try to understand the California flora, but also to try to do our part in protecting it. The Consortium of California Herbaria um, is not part of the Jepson Flora Project per se. It's a partnership among over two dozen herbaria, both primarily in California, but also outside the state, uh, herbaria or plant museums that have collections of California plants that they'd like to serve in our common portal. And so it's a basically a wonderful partnership that allows us to, um, to present together the results of all of the digitization and uh, the databases of all these herbaria around the state and outside the state, allowing us to look at all the collections and to integrate those data with the Jepson eFlora. So um, the, Cal the Consortium of California Herbaria has a portal called CCH1 that's highly curated for California vascular plants using taxonomy from the Jepson eFlora. And it's integrated tightly with the the Jepson eFlora's pages where you can find maps using CCH georeference specimens. So really important data for supporting our floristic efforts. And there are other resources online for the Jepson Flora Project. The newest are the Jepson videos on YouTube, which I strongly encourage you to check out if you haven't. We have a large collection, a large library now of these videos that Stacy Marcos and Amy Kassemeyer spearheaded. They're high quality productions on some beautiful and iconic California natives and even naturalized species with beautiful vignettes about their natural history and uh, biology. So overall, so please do check those out. Um, it will inspire you for this spring that's coming, that's starting to unfold now. So first off, I would like to talk just about the general problem of, of uh, continued discovery. Um, again, a good problem. And this has to do in part with the fact that we find ourselves here in California living within a biodiversity hotspot, a global scale biodiversity hotspot, and one of only two uh, north of Mexico recognized by Conservation International. And we call this hotspot the California Floristic Province. And you can see it outlined here on this map from Raven and Axelrod's classic um, paper. 
uh, origin and relationships of the California flora. And it basically follows on its outer edges here, the nor major north-south trending interior mountain ranges. Um, and of course, the Pacific Ocean on the, on, at the west with a little bit of northwest Baja California and southwest Oregon, but predominantly within California. And in part, this is an area um, with Mediterranean type climate, which is more pronounced in the central and southern part of the floristic province. And it's very isolated geographically from other Mediterranean type climates worldwide, the others being in central Chile, the Mediterranean basin itself in Eurasia and Northern Africa, the Cape province of South Africa, and Southwestern and a little bit of, of, a little, a bit of Southern Australia to the east of there. These are all highly isolated Mediterranean type climatic areas with wet, wet, uh, wet winters and dry summers. So that kind of a regime, which is challenging to plant life and um, these adaptations to a Mediterranean type climate have uh, arisen primarily independently in each of these five major areas of the world. They're so widely separated geographically, there's been very little long distance dispersal between them, um, at least within the time frame when those Mediterranean climates were in place. So uh, a novel flora here, a real concentration of richness and endemism, and uh, partly, well, in all these Mediterranean type climatic areas, we see extraordinarily high levels of richness and endemism. They're all considered global scale biodiversity hotspots. And it's still unclear exactly why that is, except it is a challenging regime, but also does have a wet period. And within California, at least, we have a lot of geological and climatic diversity, both spatially across the floristic province as well as across time. It's been a really dynamic geological setting, as you're no doubt aware. And there's a lot of substrate diversity, unusual harsh soils like serpentine, which um, provide us with about 10% of our endemic species within the state. And also other surfaces like limestone that are challenging to plant growth and are often areas where endemism is concentrated. And all this topographic heterogeneity um, also leads to a lot of climatic diversity as well. And interestingly, um, some recent analyses suggest that the high diversity in this area in part looks to be attributable to the ability of plants to move up or down slope or around slopes to find um, climatic uh, relief from climate change basically not having to disperse too far in these topographically heterogeneous areas oftentimes to find safe sites during climate change that may have buffered a lot of plants from extinction, including both the new endemics, um, the neo-endemics, the ones that evolved here, as well as paleo-endemics, the old endemics, like the coast redwood, giant sequoia, uh, island ironwood that uh, are older than the Mediterranean type climate within the state. And those groups, the old paleoendemics are especially associated with pockets of stable, equable climate like we find in the Channel Islands or in Klamath region, Northwestern California. So these so-called refugia, um, which have, have allowed plants that used to be more widespread than just California find their final refuge in this part of the world. So there are a lot of reasons why we have a really di diverse flora and it also extends out into the deserts to the east of the floristic province. As deserts go, at least, they're also um, notable for richness and endemism. And uh, one of the exciting things about being involved in California plant studies is that there's a lot of discoveries here still, despite it being one of the most heavily botanized areas in the world. There's a constant discovery of new plant diversity, which is part of the challenge. I'm, biodiversity challenge this workshop addresses. And uh, this figure on the right, this graphic was produced by Dean Taylor and uh, published by Barbara Erder in 2000 in a paper called Floristic Surprises in North America, showing the rate of description of endemic species or endemic taxa in California over time. You can see the year on the x-axis here, cumulative number of taxa on the y-axis, 
And you can see a very steady uh, rate of new description of taxa. Uh, this dotted line was based on a predicted inflection point that seemed to be occurring here at around 2000, but it actually hasn't materialized. And the, the rate of description and discovery has continued apace. These discoveries can be of a number of types I'll talk about, but one is just new field discoveries that keep happening in part because we have so much online information now about where collections and observations have been made. People can see where the under collected or under observed areas are, overlay rare, unusual soils or topographically heterogeneous areas over that. And you can find areas to really focus in on. And notable discoveries occur of things that had never been collected before, like the Shasta snow wreath, Nebuzia cliftoni. Um, this is a plant discovered um, a year before the first edition of the Jepson Manual. And it was um, found a short distance from Interstate 5 up by Lake Shasta growing on carbonate soils, which pose challenges to plant life. And in that same area over the years, a number of other en endemic discoveries have been made in that special area of uh, limestone and metasedimentary exposures in the Eastern Klamath Ranges, including the, the Shasta huckleberry, the Shasta maidenhair fern, the Shasta fawn lily. These are plants in different major lineages of the vascular plants that uh, some of which are very showy as you can see here, but had gone underappreciated or overlooked. And sometimes exciting uh, range extension discoveries are found of things that weren't new to science, unlike the previous um, examples, but were only known from outside the state. And I just show you this one because it was actually collected for the first time in California on a Jepson workshop held in Anza Borrego, one of the areas that Stacy showed a slide of at the intro. Um, and Mike Simpson teaching that workshop was actually teaching people about the native Boraginaceae. And one of the participants said, which one is this one? And it turned out to be the angelic Johnstonella, Johnstonella angelic anglica shown here, which is known from well south of the Baja California, California border here, these red sites. But here it is up around Borrego Springs. So, um, and recently included in the revision of Boraginaceae or Braginales for the Jepson E. flora. And sometimes, well, um, rarely, but um, really exciting types of discoveries are rediscoveries of plants that were thought to be extinct within California. This is an example of a plant that I was very interested in. I study the California tar weeds and I'll show a few examples from them today, but Deanandra mojavensis uh, was only known from herbarium specimens that dated back to the mid 1930s, never seen again after that point and presumed extinct after 60 years, no sightings. But then all of a sudden, Andy Sanders down at UC Riverside found it in the peninsular ranges. And then just very quickly, it was discovered in quite a few sites in the peninsular ranges. And also later up in the Southern Sierra in places where it was unknown to have occurred before. So um, this is one that actually became a greenhouse pest at UC Berkeley when I was growing it up from seeds that Andy sent me. And it started seeding into the Arabidopsis um, pots of the plant biology researchers in a different department on campus. And they were pretty angry with me but it was an amazing example of a plant that had kind of risen from the grave in a very um, dramatic way. Other important discoveries that we need to track and, and um, be vigilant about are naturalized taxa, that is things that have become established but are not native species. And some of these can be ecosystem disruptors like the trichia graviolans shown here on the left, the so-called stinkweed or stinkwort, um, either name's fine, but it's a, it, it's a glandular plant as the name implies. People mistake it for a tar weed. And I was hearing about this plant quite a bit from people that, th that had th thought they'd found a new species of tar weed 
And um, it would always turn out to be a new locality somewhere in the state. So it kind of spread across the state very quickly. And it was important to get it into the Jepson manual and into the keys so that in the second edition where it was included, it could be keyed and new sites could be discovered and exterminated if possible. And incidentally, it also um, aided in the discovery of a species, another species of this non-native genus, Detrichia, uh, Detrichia viscosa, which was found early in its introduction and allowed the um, weed scientists to really jump on it, the false yellowhead. So these are important kinds of discoveries that need to be um, tracked closely as well. So Willis Lynn Jepson, who founded the Jepson Herbarium in his will and was the first native born um, Californian botanist, a PhD botanist and a professor at Berkeley who wrote the first comprehensive guide to the plants of California in 1925. He was very much aware that a flora will always become out of date and that it has to be revised constantly. And at the same time, you realize that herbaria never will be out of date, that herbaria are treasure troves, these plant museums of dried specimens and other resources are places where botanists are always gonna to wanna to be um, closely inspecting collections and expanding the herbarium and learning from those collections. And one of the important things that has come to be appreciated in recent years is that herbaria are also reservoirs for discovery of undescribed biodiversity. A um, couple of prominent papers published about a dozen years ago in two extremely prestigious venues, the Proceedings of the Royal Society B and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences shown here, um, basically analyzed the number, and looked at the rate of discovery of species in tropical environments especially, and how many of those discoveries were already represented by collections in herbaria that oftentimes came to be appreciated. The presence there was only discovered after the discovery was made in the field. And this is true in temperate environments too. We generally find residing within our collections representatives of plants that have been discovered in the field or in, um, from, uh, in the lab from phylogenetic studies. Deanander batchigalupi shown here on the right, an herbarium specimen of it. Uh, this is one that I described as new to science from Alameda County in the vicinity of Livermore in around 2000. So this is in the same county that Berkeley resides in, a pretty heavily botanized area. And um, this is a plant that Robert Hoover, Jepson's last PhD student, collected in the 1960s, shortly before he died. And it resided in our collection without an identification to species. But Remo Bacigalupi included an annotation on this specimen later saying this does not match any um, currently known species of tarweed. And so I named it for him, um, but really only focused on this collection after having seen it in the field and came to appreciate from our phylogenetic data that it really was something distantly related to the species that it had been accidentally considered part of, Deanandra and Crescens. So the Consortium of California Berry I mentioned earlier is a real treasure trove of collections, uh, an interface online, two interfaces, CCH1, the California Vascular Plant Interface is one where we can go and um, look basically at the collections of California plants, at least the digitized information on them. And we have a mechanism for highlighting plants there that are out of range, according to the range that we understand from the Jepson E. flora um, treatments, uh, the so-called yellow flags and the range maps that can allow us to pinpoint problems that need attention, uh, which sometimes are just georeferencing errors or a problem even with the distribution string in the Jepson E flora that needs modification, but sometimes they represent undescribed um, taxa or taxa that weren't uh, recognition. So it can help to identify collections of special interest. 
So then if the big question arises, how do we decide whether a plant should be proposed or accepted as a new to science taxon? And so this is uh, basically my entree into talking about taxonomy, which is a, the oldest um, field of science. And it even predates all Western science, all indigenous groups have their own taxonomies of organisms and non-living things as well, really important for understanding the diversity of life and non-living things around you living off the land. And it's uh, something that um, is one of the earliest sciences um, in biology for sure. And it's really concerned with classification of life, um, hierarchy of name groups or taxa. And so a taxon, plural is taxa, is just any formally named group at any rank. So it could be a species, a genus, a family as we get to these more and more inclusive ranks. So for example, common sunflower, Helianthus annuus is a species. Uh, the genus Helianthus is a genus uh, that, that contains several species. Um, and the genus Helianthus belongs to the family Asteraceae or Compositae, the sunflower family, and on and on up the chain, all the way up to phylum or kingdom. So, um, but an important point that I wanna raise here is that just because a taxon has been formally and validly named and recognized by others even, it does not mean that we are obliged to accept it in a taxonomy that we adopt. So, there are rules of nomenclature I'll talk about later that dictate how one has to go about naming taxa. But as far as the tax, taxa themselves, the criteria for recognizing a taxon, um, that's really a matter of judgment on the part of scientists. There are cases where taxonomies are adopted by groups of scientists. And these in general are taxonomies at higher levels like for families or orders. Um, so this is a, there's a case in the angiosperms, the flowering plants, the so-called angiosperm phylogeny group has a regularly updated classification of orders and families of flowering plants um, that is based on phylogenetic data, the best evidence. And similarly, the people who work on ferns and lycophytes have a community-derived classification of families and orders, the pteridophyte phylogeny group, they call themselves. But even though these are authoritative classifications, we're not even obliged to accept those. And there are cases where we deviate, for example, from the angiosperm phylogeny group's family classification, because in some cases, even though there's strong molecular support, for example, for some families like asparagaceae in the broad sense, there's very little morphological um, data that can be used to diagnose such a family. And so we tended to break that family up into smaller families. We recognize a set of smaller families, each natural groups that are better diagnosed morphologically. So there are some instances like that, but in general, um, these are very useful community drive classifications. So in deciding whether a plant should be proposed or accepted as new to science, the main criterion that, that a modern taxonomist or systematist, as they're sometimes called, would use is whether or not the plants in question taken together are evolutionarily distinct from all other um, named taxa at that particular rank of classification. So when we say evolutionarily, evolutionary distinct in modern taxonomy, what we mean is, do those plants taken together represent an evolutionary lineage or a, what we call a clade, which are all the descendants of a common ancestor, which also is called a monophyletic group. Um, so basically one phylum, one, one phy phyla, a, a single lineage, um, a, a monophyletic group or clade. So that's that's one of the main criteria that goes into modern taxonomy. 
And so a monophyletic group or a clade, as I mentioned, all descendants of a common ancestor are, um, some examples are shown here. These, this, these are five different little evolutionary trees, very simplified diagrams, sometimes called cladograms, where the root in each case is down here at the base. And these tips in each case represent modern lineages, the, the modern representatives of these lineages that are connected together by um, where we have evolutionary divergence events. So here you can see, for example, a clade of, with three terminal taxa here at the tips of each of these three. Um, and you can see that uh, within, for example, this clade, there are three other um, lineages here, three other clades. So clades often include additional clades. And it could be that from an analysis, we found that these are three clades that are not described currently and that they need to be um, recognized as taxa. So this is a the kind of um, representation of relationships that often comes from different kinds of phylogenetic analyses using morphological or molecular data or both. And a phylogenetic system of classification is really, has been the goal of um, systematics and taxonomy since the time of Darwin. Everyone was, once people were on board with the evolutionary theory of Darwin and Wallace, that was so beautifully um, described by Darwin in his Origin of Species, which is the place in the first edition where this diagram on the right was published. This is the only figure in the first edition of Darwin's Origin of Species. You can see it looks very much like the trees I was just showing you, um, a branching diagram. This has been really a goal of taxonomy to try to understand um, these kinds of relationships and to classify organisms accordingly. But there was a real inability to, to actually infer phylogeny in a rigorous way and even discuss phylogenetic relationships in a rigorous way prior to the late 20th century. But that's not when taxonomy began, obviously. And there was a lot of effort to try to um, come up with more rigorous taxonomies before that point as well, that I want to talk about in the next module. But at this point, we'll stop for questions.